well. That others have thought it wasn't even heavy, Lord. But I know the burden is great. And I know that the word of the Lord that he's going to bring tonight is going to pierce the darkness. Father, we ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We ask for fresh wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of who you are. God, we're asking that you would break down every wall and every barrier, Lord. We lift up a cry tonight that your word would be preached. That... We would hear the word of the Lord. Father, would you open our ears tonight to hear what your spirit is saying to the church in Indiana and in the Midwest. God, I pray and thank you for this voice of awakening, for this voice that stirs the waters of the hearts of men and women. Lord, I honor my brother and I thank you for what's about to take place, for it's holy unto the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. Let's give Paul a round of applause. Who brought your Bible? I know it's written on your heart too. But if you could turn to the book of Acts. I was starting to get some of the calls last night after I fell asleep. Woke up at about 3.50 to use the restroom and checked my phone and Noticed I was coming here tonight. (laughs) So, it's a true story. I uh, booked a flight at 440 after I prayed. And, um, you know, I've had the privilege of, of fighting so many wars in America and the nations. Typically, every year I go to about 25 states and around 45 to 50 cities and having the privilege of traveling around from literally coast to coast in different nations and having the burden as Paul does also locally um, you know there's just that gear that you develop that revivalists have and honestly I, I know hundreds of itinerant ministers around the nation but maybe just a handful are revivalists And that revivalist is that ability to switch gears on a dime. So literally, if you hear revival at 440, I'll see you tonight. There's this, it's a gear, it's a, you've been conditioned, you've been wounded in the best of ways. That at any moment, if something happens in Wilmore, Kentucky, I'm there. Uh, You don't even think, you know, something's happening in Avon, Indiana, I'm there. Something, you know. The Lord invites you into your prayer closet. I'm there. And so I want to encourage you. Part of what's happening is the Holy Ghost is allowing you to flex your spiritual muscles and begin to get revival blood flowing in your veins. And he's, you know, the flexibility and all of these great things. It's happening all across the earth. Uh, We were in Scotland uh, last month. My wife and I ministering, didn't even know Scotland is not postmodern, it's pre Christian. Wow. Talking 1%. Jesus, who? Why? Who's Jesus? I mean, you realize there are countries in the earth. Who's Jesus? Yes, we saw an incredible harvest and in gathering of souls, 400 people per session. Who's Jesus? Responding to the gospel. Casting demons out of them into the wee hours of the morning. God is alive. God is real. And as I prayed about last night, Lord, is there assignment? I want to make sure that this is you. He spoke a a very clear word to my heart about religious persecution. I believe that I am here on assignment tonight to help you process what you've been through, and to prepare you for what you're going to go through. I believe that I have an assignment here tonight to help you process through some of the religious persecution that you've already been through, and I'm also here to prepare you for the religious persecution that will come. I believe that revival is when we fully yield our lives to the working 
of the Holy Spirit, which requires repentance. When someone says revival, you should immediately have the word repentance in mind. Revival, repentance. Revival is yielding to the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, which requires repentance, it requires obedience, trust, and partnership. There's revival that's breaking out all over the earth. Why? Because churches and ministries and individuals are learning how to yield their lives, their marriages, their families to the working of the Holy Spirit, which requires repentance, obedience, trust, and partnership. Why don't we see the word revival in the New Testament? You don't need a word for what they walked in. We're going to read tonight in the book of Acts, the first century church, a people who yielded to the workings of the Holy Spirit in their lives, which required repentance and obedience and trust and partnership with the Holy Spirit. If you don't like the word revival, I'm fine with it. It doesn't bother me. I don't see it in Scripture. That's fine. Give me another word. Holy Spirit ministry. What's revival? It's being fully yielded and turned over to the Holy Spirit. It's repenting of sin. It's obeying Him. It's partnering with Him. It's inviting Him into every area of life. So hear the word of the Lord. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. This is what God is saying to you present tonight. I have come to give you the gift of resiliency. Resiliency is the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. I am here tonight by way of Charlotte, North Carolina to prophesy to every person in this meeting and those watching online. The Spirit of God has come tonight with a present, with a gift. And the gift is called resiliency. It is the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulty. It is also the ability to spring back into shape after a period of weariness and fatigue. Resiliency is the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulty. It is also the ability to spring back into shape after a period of weariness and fatigue. The Spirit of God says, I have come to help you navigate through the religious persecution that has come and will come As you steward revival, there is a direct connection tonight through processing religious persecution and preparing you for it, which will then help you steward revival. Attending these meetings is about seeds of awakening and revival and hunger and repentance and there's got to be more. When you're in this atmosphere, these seeds get planted down on the inside of your heart. And then as they get planted down on the inside of our hearts, we then as the gardeners of our own soil have the responsibility to tend the revival seeds. You are called as a watchman and a watchwoman to care for the seeds of revival that have been planted down into your heart, but be warned. The Spirit of God is putting you on notice. Beware of the religious persecution 
that has come into your life and that will come and will seek to uproot the seeds of revival that God is planting this week. I feel by the Spirit of God, you're going to begin to hear the whispers from the religious, whispers from friends and family members that are going to launch attacks against this church. They're going to launch attacks against these leaders. They're going to launch attacks against anyone and everyone who's hungry for more of God. There is something about the religious spirit that hates radical and that hates extreme. It bothers the religious spirit when people start getting radical and extreme because now we can't be controlled. You oftentimes, again, I've been to hundreds and hundreds over the last decade of churches and ministries all over the world. Oftentimes, the spirit of generosity financially gets unearthed in revival. Why? Because if the devil can keep you poor, he can control you. Right. Say that. Religion is about control. Yes. Religion is about keeping you in a nice, tidy box. Religion is keeping you praying prayers from your lips that you really don't mean from your heart. Religious spirit is about you singing songs that you really don't mean. Religious spirit is about you coming to services, checking off a box, and then going back to your life. I believe that God wants to show us in the Word tonight how religious persecution works and how to respond to it. Satan has no new tricks. They are only new if we are not rooted and grounded in the Word of God. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit for grace tonight that as we walk through the book of Acts tonight, you will begin to realize the rumble and the stirring that you feel in your heart today in the 21st century is the same rumble and stirring that they felt in the 1st century. And it is wisdom and it is right to go back in seasons of revival and reacquaint ourselves with the Word of God so that at least we can be comforted that we're not alone, but at best, we can be alerted to what's about to happen. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. In Acts chapter 2, we're very familiar with this passage. Pentecost. They're gathered in the upper room waiting for the promise of the Father, which we understand it appeared like a flame above each of their heads and they're speaking in tongues that are understood by men and women of different languages because there's a mass gathering at this time. So there's a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to track with me tonight. There's a powerful move of the Holy Spirit and then right there next to the move an observation is a little crowd. And the little crowd, the first move of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, it only says there's a little bit of mocking and there's a little bit of laughing. Right. So Peter has to give up and get up and give an explanation. It's three. These men are not drunk as you suppose. He says this is that. And he quotes the prophet Joel. And he says we are living right now what was prophesied years ago. A move of God, Pentecost, and a little bit of 
religious jabbing and persecution. I'm going to show you over the next several minutes tonight moves of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts constantly either preceded or followed by religious persecution. Stirrings and moves and prophecies and breakthrough and deliverance either preceded by religious persecution or followed. And again, the goal is to uproot the seeds of revival that have been planted in our heart and let religious persecution. Some of you are going to realize, oh man. I like caught fire in 1999 and then I got offended with the church in 2000 and I look back and I'm like, man, offense, a wrong response to religious persecution killed my revival fire. I'm here tonight and some people have an assignment. I've done it to expose the religious spirit. I'm not necessarily here to do that tonight. I'm here to reveal to you that the way you respond to religious persecution will determine how you steward revival. Oh, I feel it. The way you respond in Indiana and wherever you're from, the way you respond to religious persecution will directly affect the way you steward revival fire. I've never preached this before. This is not like one of these messages. I'm, a, you know, I'm like a revival junkie and you get put in the jukebox and here we go. I'm telling you, this is a message from the Lord come on, come on. that you can judge, that you can test, and you can weigh. And as I opened up the book of Acts again in the last 24 hours, my eyes have been opened once again to clear biblical insight and revelation that God wants to gift you tonight with a gift of resiliency so that when religious persecution comes and tries to knock you down, you have a gift called resiliency that can help you bounce back. Some of you in this room, you're wrestling with revival and hunger because the pain and sting of religious persecution is still in your body and soul and spirit. And God wants to extract the sting of religious persecution from the past so that you can steward present day revival now. And then there are some people in this room, I'm going to encourage you, get the fire, get the glory, get the spirit of prayer. But don't leave this meeting surprised. When friends and family and people that you know They're not ready to help you steward fire. They're coming to persecute you and cause you to go back. So let's pray together tonight. Father, thank you that this is the time, this is the day, this is the hour on your calendar that you have appointed every person in this room every person online to hear. And Lord, I pray that we would hear what your spirit is saying to the ecclesia in Indiana and to the four corners of the earth. Lord, I believe that this is a message for America and the nations who are about to steward unprecedented revival. Lord, I pray that religious persecution would not uproot the fresh fire you want to put on the altar of the hearts of your people. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, Pentecost, Holy Ghost fire. There's a little laughing, there's a little mocking. Peter gives a message, he explains this is that. He preaches, repent. We see an ingathering of souls, about 3,000. 
You have Acts 2, 42 through 47. They begin to develop a wineskin of the first century church. It's glorious. Then you get to Acts chapter 3. And in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are used by the Lord to heal a crippled beggar at a, a temple gate called Beautiful. And it is an extraordinary miracle. We know as you get deeper into Acts 3 and 4 that this man was around 40 years old at the time of his miracle. So imagine knowing someone who could not walk a day in their life for 40 years. And all of a sudden, maybe you're hearing whispers of Pentecost, tongues of fire, Holy Ghost outpouring. It's causing a stir in Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, later in time, there's a miracle that bursts forth into the day. And there's all sorts of commentary and there's all sorts of language going around about this great miracle and again some people are excited but here comes religious persecution let's read it in acts 4 i want to begin in 1 through 5 so they've performed a miracle they preach repentance here we go acts 4 And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. So again, Holy Spirit outpouring. What kind of persecution? Not much. Just a little joking, a little laughing. Then Acts 3, a lame crippled beggar is healed. A greater miracle takes place. And now you just don't have a little mocking and a little laughing. Now the religious crowd is going to do more than that. They're going to arrest them. And what I want to say tonight, what I believe the Holy Spirit has said to me for this gathering is this. Religious persecution seeks to arrest you. In other words, it wants to restrain It wants to subdue, it wants to question and confuse, it wants to threaten and hinder the forward movement of the Holy Spirit in your life. We're here tonight under a revelation that God is sending revival to this city and to the nations of the earth and he's inviting us To yield and follow and repent and obey. But as we begin to do it, it brings its rewards. God will withhold no good thing from those who seek His face. I love prayer. I love repentance. I love the move of God because God's not deaf. God hears our prayers. God responds to hunger. So I get excited in this atmosphere tonight. I'm like, oh, Lord, thank God. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. People are praying that people are repenting. Lord, I know you're going to move. But all of a sudden in Acts chapter 4, the religious persecution cranks up a bit. All of a sudden, the more radical you get for God, the greater steps you take to make a place for him, Religious persecution steps up a notch. And all of a sudden, that little laugh and that little joke and that little mock from your friends and family, your spouse, the church down the road, it intensifies a bit. And rather than just laughing and mocking, now it's going to come to arrest you. It's going to come to constrain you. It's going to come to threaten you. It's going to come to shut you down. It's going to come to harass and intimidate you and say, just stop. Stop praying. 
Stop going all in. It doesn't take all of that. If you keep the fire burning, there's going to be consequences. We're going to have to arrest you and quiet you. It's interesting though. They're arrested and they're put on trial for the healing of a lame crippled beggar. But in verse 13 it says, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John... They understood that they were uneducated, untrained men. And they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. When shown the fruit and proof of the Holy Spirit's work, Religious persecution will either subside, in this case it says they had nothing to say, or as we get deeper into the book of Acts, it will only intensify and get uglier. Right. I'm trying to talk to you tonight about a progression in your spiritual walk with God. I'm trying to talk to you about the deeper you go in God, the less you can take with you. I'm trying to talk about the greater steps of obedience and partnership that you take with the Holy Spirit, the harder the devil is going to fight you to arrest you and keep you just... What if the devil is okay that you've only half-stepped and not full stepped what if for some of us last year we didn't speak in tongues and this year now we do but what if the devil is okay with the little tongues but really he doesn't want you to get filled again see there's a progression in the book of acts that holy spirit is trying to show us it began at Pentecost with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But all throughout the book of Acts, you see a wave of Holy Spirit activity. And then here comes religious persecution. And then another wave of Holy Spirit activity. And another wave of religious persecution. And here we find ourselves tonight in the midst of a Holy Spirit wave. And what God is saying to you tonight is... Is I need to help you process what you've been through so that you can receive what's happening now. And then I also need to warn you from the word of God of what's about to come so that the devil doesn't steal the revival seeds he's sowing this week. There's not one person in this room that God's not talking to. Because everyone in this room has either been wounded by the religious system and persecuted because you tried to step out for more of God or you're here tonight and religious spirit and accusation is going to knock on your door and if you don't listen to what God is saying, you're going to be surprised and you're going to become a victim of religion when God wants to make you a victor of revival. Religious accusation. Persecution comes and it comes to arrest. One more time. It seeks to arrest you. It's going to restrain you, subdue you, question and confuse. It wants to threaten and hinder the forward movement of the Holy Spirit's work in your life. In this instance, early on, when the crippled man is presented to them, here's the fruit. They say, oh, what's going over there at the Father? Oh, people are delivered. They're set free. They're like, oh, okay. I'm not going to mess with that. They hear somebody testify, my leg was broke, now it's here. Okay, you know, that's cool. It's either going to quiet down the evidence, the fruit of the move of God, or as we're going to see in the book of Acts, it no longer quiets it. It's actually the more fruit and the more evidence of the Holy Spirit, the angrier that demon gets. Yes. Some, some of you, let, let me... 
Let me help you process what's in your mind, the conversations. You're going to call your mom. Hey, have you heard what's happening in Avon? Have you heard what's happening at the church? Have you heard about Asbury? Have you heard about the move of God? Have you seen the new Jesus movie? Not everybody on the other end of the phone is excited about that. Because the revival they're hearing about is exposing the religious spirit in them. And, and if you don't have a, a biblical understanding of revival is always preceded or followed by religious accusation, you're going to feel all alone. You're going to feel like an orphan and not be equipped with the knowledge of, oh, yeah, just what I'm experiencing is what they experienced in Acts. This is to totally normal. People lose friends in revival. People lose relationships. People lose a whole lot in revival, things of the world. But you know what? They gain Christ. I, don't, I feel the heart of the Father. I don't want any of you to be unprepared or caught off guard. I want us to count the cost. I want you to consider that when you take a giant leap of faith in the kingdom of God, Satan's going to try to come out of the woodwork and take a right hook. But again, if you and I understand the process, that giant leap of faith can be preceded by a bow low so that when the devil swings, he can't hit us because we've already died to our pride and our arrogance and our need to explain the move of God. Just stop. Provide the evidence. Here's what I've seen and what I've heard. And it might quiet them and be good enough. But you might also see as we're getting ready to see it will actually enrage those demonic forces. How did the apostles respond to this religious persecution? They arrest them. They're on trial. Let's look at their words. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. And when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which they might punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. When they had been released, they went to their companions and reported all that happened. When they heard this, they lifted up their voices with one voice and they quote Psalm 2. So they're going back. I want, hear me. In the midst of persecution, they're going back and finding comfort in the word of God. If the, if the apostles, the boys of Jesus, when they're facing religious persecution, if they go back to the word of God and say, this is that, why are the rulers plotting in vain? Why are the nations raging against the Lord and his anointed? When we face religious persecution in this hour, we're going to have to run back to the book of Acts and the word of God as comfort and nutrients for our soul so that we don't begin to believe we're the only ones and we've no, no one's ever been this way. Baby, we've already been this way before. And the truth is real revival is just simply New Testament Christianity. Folks, the church has fallen so asleep. Christianity has become a place where it's like we host demon daycares and call them churches. We have allowed the lukewarm and the complacent and the unregenerate to think they're saved when they're really not. So that when we start calling for revival, what is it? Repent. We should be doing that every day. You know what I said to our brother? I said, why doesn't that happen every day in everyone's life? Why can't we find 30 minutes, 45 minutes? Well, I got kids. Good, I do too. You can wake up early. You can stay up late at night. Can we find 30 to 45 minutes a day to repent our sins and say, Lord, cleanse me and know me? Find any. Can we just do that every day? 
I'm living in revival. I'm living in awakening. The Holy Spirit is real. He's active. He's alive. I can feel him. I can sense him. Why? Because I'm not weighted down by sin. Lord, send revival. How do they respond to religious persecution? One, they hold their ground. We're going to obey God rather than you. Two, they held on to the word of God. Again, one more time. God is wanting to help us to rightly respond to religious persecution so that we can steward revival. Somebody starts coming at you, attacking the more, attacking a move of God. What do we do? How do we respond rightly? We hold our ground. We pledge allegiance to Jesus and not man. Number two, we appeal to the word of God. And then number three, I love this. Verse 31, they go back to the word of God and then they go back to pray. And they go back to the place of prayer and they say, Lord, take note of their threats. Lord, you just heard the religious accusations. And now, Lord, because you've heard the religious accusations, I want you to hear what the Spirit of God is saying tonight. Lord, you just heard the persecution coming from my friends and family. And now, Lord, my prayer is crank up the heat. You didn't hear me. Oh, Lord. Have you seen how hurt I am? Folks, I'm, I'm telling you, God is putting his finger on us becoming victimized by religious accusation. Some of us, we haven't been in church. We've been hurt by this. We've been hurt by that. That person did that and that person did that. And the Lord is saying, actually, when real persecution comes, it's actually a vehicle to promotion rather than an excuse for you to sit on the sideline. Folks, these brothers, little, oh, God, they arrested us. I mean, we got away this time, but what's going to happen next? And it, you, we should be in great fear, seize the church, and uh-uh. These brothers boldly held their ground. They appealed to the word of God. And then they go back to prayer, and they say, Lord, we want more signs, wonders, and miracles. Lord, we want more fire. Oh, the town's calling us a cult. They haven't seen anything yet. Oh, they caught a little tongs. Oh, they're falling. Listen, God is raising up revival communities all over the earth who are going to become even more undignified than this. They're, they're not going to bow down to religious persecution and say, you know what, you're right. I am too radical. I do pray. I pray too much. I speak in tongues too much. Oh, you're right. It wasn't real. They faked it. Listen, I don't care if they faked it. I'm not faking it. Welcome to like the internet. Oh, it's fake. They fell, you know, they pushed him down. That's fine, but I didn't get pushed down. I fell out. Oh, that miracle was rehearsed. Mine wasn't. Mine was real. You can have your little religious accusations about what's happening in revival in someone else's life, but I'm going to hold my ground and testify about the work of the gospel in my life, and I'm going to show you according to the Word of God that we were never intended to settle for dry, boring, stale American Christianity. It's not in there. I'm not ashamed. I'm not fearful. I'm emboldened by your accusations. I get excited. Keep talking smack. Keep talking trash about revival. Because here's what they're saying. Because God hears you. They literally go into prayer and say, Lord, you just heard the smack talk. 
And on account of you hearing it, we want you to up the ante. And you know what it says? The place where they met was shaken. Brothers and sisters. I, I've got to believe those boys were like, oh, yeah, you thought the upper room was good? You thought the little tongues of fire and the little, the, you thought that was great? We're going to pray so hard that the building shakes. Yes, sir. Oh. God is dealing tonight with how we're going to respond to religious, I'm going to keep saying it, how we're going to respond to religious persecution so that when it comes, we're learning how to rightly steward revival. How are we doing tonight? Glory to God. Here's what he said to me. A right response. And here's the thing. Oh, my gosh. I love the Bible. Dude. Hold on. Hold on. Wish I could do a backflip. Hold on. The building shook. Hold on. Hold on. The building shook. And then what happens? Yeah. Come on. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart yeah. and one soul. Yeah. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. Come on. But all things were common property to them. Yeah. Folks, we need earth shaking revival prayer meetings. Yes, sir. We do not. Some of you, God is going to break the power of intimidation and the fear of man off of your life. Some of you are literally afraid of the opinions of people and what they think about tongues, what they think about healing, what they think about revival. God wants to loose you and set captives free tonight and give you a sense of normalcy. Revival is biblical. Revival is right. Revival is New Testament Christianity. We should have never settled when we did, but thank God. God for 2023 I'm in revival now and I am not going back I am not allowing the whispers of the religious spirit to take out my fire in fact if I've got it right if I've got it right religious persecution stokes my fire it doesn't put out my fire the more people talk and the more people accuse the more fired up God gets and says I want to do more Come on. Come on. Yes, sir. Come on. I want to unify you. Come on. Rightly responding to persecution, it brings unity. Yeah. It brings generosity. It brings the blessing of God. What could God do with a small band of believers in Indiana who locked arms together and said, I got your back. And you can call me when your mom is ticked and your grandmother's mad and your sister and your aunt and everybody online is cursing the move of God in Indiana and Kentucky. We're just going to pray them right into the throne room of heaven. We're going to learn to bless those who curse us. We're going to learn how to see every arrow that the devil fires our way. We're going to take everything that was meant for evil and we're going to turn it into good. Oh! All right, this is just the first scene. Are we ready? How are we doing? <laughs> little Pentecost, little joking, little mocking. Major miracle, move of God. Lame, crippled, beggar healed. Then they go to arrest Peter and John. They crank it up a bit. It's not laughter and mocking. Now we're going to arrest them. And they learn how to rightly respond to religious persecution by holding their ground by grabbing hold of the word of God, by getting into the place of prayer, and then the Lord sends another outpouring. They were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit again in Acts 4. Glory to God. All right, Acts 5, turn that page. Another filling, another outpouring, religious persecution comes. Acts 5, oh my gosh! 
Ananias and Sapphira. When's the last time you heard Acts 5 preached? And they were absolutely believers. Don't buy into some false grace doctrine telling you they were unbelievers. These were believers in the church who lied to the Holy Spirit and held back on God. Do I believe that this was a major occurrence in the life of the first century church that God used? But again, before you get sour on me, you got to read the Bible. Amen. Folks, when the Holy Spirit, when they were struck down, again, hear me. There was such a resiliency in the first yes, century sir. church. Yes, sir. There was some kind of grit. There was some kind of real conversion. Yes. There was some kind of they'd been with Jesus. So that when persecution come, they weren't blown back by the wind. Ah, brother, should we have met during COVID? I'm going there. I heard it's got about a 99% survival rate. You think we should meet? You know what I said, Bishop? The first century church had about a 99% chance of death, and they still met. Hold on. A 99% chance that they were going to be murdered, but they still met. Yet we have a 99% survival rate and people still have not gone back to church. People already didn't need an excuse not to attend. Now they've just been gifted years and years of complacency and apathy. And let me tell you something, as a traveling guy, I talk to itinerants, we've never seen so much demonic deliverance than right now. Come on, you're right. What happened? People got locked in a house for two years, yeah. addicted to you know what, yes, sir. Come on. full of devils yeah. coming out of the pandemic, and they're everywhere. they're everywhere. I cast 10, 20, 100 demons out of every meeting. They just start man. You're like, oh my gosh, what is this? Yeah. It's the result of an apathetic complacent, probably non-converted, going to church every Sunday, behavior modification, haven't really surrendered, haven't really said, yes, Lord, I'm ready for revival. And the moment someone gives them a little issue or a little pushback, oh, I'm out. And I'm telling you tonight, God is going to raise up an army in this city, in this state, in this nation who have grit, have a, have a gift of resiliency that when the devil comes and tries to give a pushback, we give him some. And when he comes to try to intimidate, when he comes to try to throw fear our way, the Holy Spirit, the Lion of Judah, begins to roar deep down on the inside of us. And I'm not going to bow to mammon. I'm not going to bow to disease. I'm not going to bow to governors or principalities. The only person I'm bowing to is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Two folks struck dead. Did it scatter the church? No. If you actually read it, the fear of the Lord comes upon them. And all of a sudden, it separates the goats and the sheep. All of a sudden, it tells people, this is serious. You better get right with God. You better. We got kids in the room. Here we go. On the heels of Acts 5, verse 12. And at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. What am I saying? Here comes another move of God. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. In other words, all of a sudden, the world began to revere the church because they saw a holy and righteous God. Ooh. Look, 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 look. 14. And all the more of the... What happened? The church was growing. What if our church growth models in America are not biblical? What if every time we water down the gospel to get butts in seats, we strip it of its true power? 
What if we have lost the confrontational nature of the gospel that drops a plumb line and invites conviction of sin and makes room for people to actually get right with God? Do it again, Lord. I don't want you like, Lord, send revival to America. Folks, I'm like, Lord, drop a plumb line. Send the fear of who you are. Lord, if it does not involve repentance, it's not real revival. It's manufactured. It's cotton candy. It's ice cream. It's a pep rally. I'm telling you folks, if these meetings don't translate into you meeting with God as a lifestyle, you are not in revival. You are at a pep rally. There was something down on the inside of them adding. And here, listen to this. It gets crazier. Here comes more miracles to such an extent that people would put the sick out on the street. Yes, sir. Hoping that Peter's shadow would pass them by. And by a mere shadow, people are healed. Amen. And the move of God the few weeks before, now we're healing crippled beggars. But as they walk out this revival journey, now we're getting into shadows healing people. And believers lying to the Holy Spirit being struck down dead. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen? You know what's coming, folks. Come on. I'm trying to tell you by the word of the Lord, you know what's coming. The deeper we go in God, the louder that religious devil's going to manifest. 17, but the high priest rose up along with all his associates. Listen, they were filled with jealousy. Come on. Come on. Hear me. Religious persecution is rooted in jealousy. It oftentimes manifests as fear or resentment of another's success. It speaks against a person. It goes on a vendetta to hurt their credibility. Jealousy keeps someone from being admired. Jealousy actually engages in a conspiracy to kill people's public image. Oh, you get into revival, you get into the more of God. You know the reason why your family or friend maybe really doesn't want to hear about the work of God in your life, your marriage, or your church? They're jealous. Come on now. So we can't figure it out. I mean, what's the disconnect here? Why can't I be friends with everybody? We love God. You love God. Listen, fire does not mix with some things. Amen. Some of you need to understand it's not you. It's the fire. Amen. Your fire are irritating their demons. Amen. I'm telling you all in this room, we're like, oh, what's the, what's the deal? It just got weird this year. I started fasting more, started speaking in tongues more, and I'm just like losing this connect with friends and family who I just once hung out with. I just can't. They're jealous. They were filled with jealousy. Why? Because the church was growing in number and power. And all of a sudden, the spirit of religious accusation rose up and said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm going to kill your public image. I'm going to send little minions out. And I'm going to I'm going to send little religious minions out. And I'm going to start whispering lies about that leader to you. They're false. Let me tell you a little dirt about them. And what's happening? There is a spirit of jealousy at work in that person. Most of the time, it's Saul. Saul was okay with David as long as they were mentors. But the moment Saul heard, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands... 
Saul was not a father. He was an orphan. Rather than being excited, hearing about a son growing in success and influence and the work of the Holy Spirit, it enraged him. Folks, I want to encourage you to find leaders and find people and find a tribe who enjoys you growing in God. Get around people who love that you refuse to be in neutral. Stop hanging around people pulling you into the shallows and shadows of Christianity. Get away from them. Stop believing their lies. Call them out on their jealousy. The reason why you're attacking them is because you're jealous that God is blessing them and reminding you why you're not. Oh, oh, that person on that platform and they've just grown arrogant and prideful, says the man who's hiding his talents in the dark. Oh, it's easy to criticize from the sidelines. We, we have made professional quarterback critics and addicts with Facebook accounts online who have no skin in the game. Oh, jealousy. Some of you need to hear that again. I'm so glad the meeting went long last night so I can preach long. <laughs> jealousy. Listen to me. Jealousy oftentimes manifests as fear or resentment of another's success. It's speaking against a person, going on a vendetta to hurt their credibility. It's keeping them from being admired. Even worse, it's engaging in a conspiracy to hurt their public image. It's the whole strike the shepherd to scatter the sheep. You know when the Lord raises up real leaders in the body of Christ? I mean authentic ones. How you know they're legit is because the amount of warfare swirling around them. You're right, bro. Oh man, if no one's saying anything bad about your leader, they ain't leading. I mean, can I take, let's just put it in your, in your field. If no one is irritated and agitated at your work and your family, that you would rather skip lunch break and seek God? Come on. If you would just rather shut off the Netflix tonight and get in the place of prayer? As we pursue the deeper things of God, as we go into the spirit of revival, jealousy is going to come talking and knocking on the door. And God wants to prepare us tonight for that nasty spirit so that we know how to overcome. Yes, sir. Now, here's something cool. How do they respond to jealousy? Well, in this instance, they don't have to. Because <laughs> that spirit of jealousy goes ahead and arrests them right. and locks them up. And guess what? An angel breaks open the jail. Hold on now. There's going to be seasons of your life when people are going to attack and they're going to criticize and Holy Ghost is going to say, shh, I've got this one. You don't need to provide the evidence. You don't need to argue. You don't need to try to send them six different photocopies of proof that the lady got healed from cancer. Just stop at one. They'll never believe. There is such a spirit of unbelief. Let, let, let me throw this at you. A wicked and perverse generation asks for a sign. Yeah. But wait yeah. a minute. A wicked and a perverse generation asks for a sign. But then we know in the word of God, we're supposed to be praying for signs. So which is it? <laughs> it's a wicked and perverse generation. You know why they're wicked asking for a sign? Because even when God says it, they still won't believe. Folks, you've got to discern the people around you 
Is it that they just need a deeper and they need evidence and that's what will really draw them in? Or is there such a religious, critical, hardened heart that you're simply wasting your time, money, and energy and you just need to leave them to the angels? And I feel the love of the Father tonight, folks. I feel the divine counsel of God giving us nuggets and wisdom and helping us on our journey as we go deeper. And God, he's so kind to let us know the traps, the deception, what we might fall in. God, thank you for revealing in your word what they went through in the first century so that as we navigate revival in the 21st century, we don't believe the lie. We've never been this way before. Angel breaks them out, but angel doesn't break them out and then send them to another city. Dude, this is hilarious. These I'm telling you, these dudes had resiliency. The angel breaks them out. They were just arrested for preaching and teaching. He breaks them out. You know what they do? They go right back to preaching and teaching. They were not afraid. They were not deterred. They were not a victim of church hurt. They went right back preaching and teaching. And all of a sudden, the authorities are like, what, what happened? Oh, they, they're out. What's, what's going on? And again, they're put on another trial. Verse 29, Peter and the apostles answer them, We must obey God rather than men. Amen. Folks, in the name of Jesus, may you break soul ties with the opinions of men. May every form of manipulation and control, every power of religious witchcraft that's been assigned to Indiana and the nations, let its grip be broken tonight in Jesus' name. And let your resolve to obey God, let your resolve to get a good job from Father, let that be the banner over your life. I refuse to allow the disobedience of religious people around me produce disobedience in me. I refuse to allow their lack of fire to keep my fire out. Folks, I'm telling you, because they had resiliency, the more lack of fire and the more persecution they ran into, the more fired up they got. Glory to God. We got to obey God. Verse 33, but when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and were intending to slay them. Hold on now. I'm going to give it to you. Are you ready? The ultimate end of the religious spirit and the spirit of accusation is death. Some people don't realize this. Started as a little joking, a little mocking in Acts 2. Then it turns into an arrest. Then in Acts 4 here and 5, they're going to be flogged. They're going to be beaten. We're going to increase a little bit of the warfare now. But ultimately, the revival fire and that pursuit of more and it stirs up that spirit of jealousy and anger, it enrages the religious spirit so much that they crucify Jesus. They stone Stephen, and they will do anything in their power to keep you lukewarm. Oh, folks, what if the greatest hindrance to American revival is the belief that you're saved just because you go to church? I want to present to you, what if the devil is okay with church attendance? What if the devil is perfectly thrilled with three songs and a nice message and I give my tithe? What if he will even fight us to keep us there? Yes, sir. Who comes to their rescue here? An angel rescued them before. Now the Lord uses a teacher of the law. 
Here's what the Lord wants to say to us. Rightly responding to religious persecution brings wisdom and help from unlikely places and spaces. They have stirred up religious accusation enough that these people want to kill them. And all of a sudden, Gamaliel, however you want to pronounce it, a teacher of the law, Paul's teacher, stands up and says, hey, if God is with them, there's nothing you can do about it. If God is not with them, they'll fail. But notice here how they rightly respond to religious criticism unlocks the door for the voice of God to speak through unlikely places and spaces. Was this Tucker, Tucker Carlson? Was this Fox News? You have an Asbury revival and a hunger and you have criticism and you have and nobody there responded to any of the criticism. But did a voice in the news rise up and say, it's, if it's of God, let it be. If it's not, it'll fall. Oh, Folks, I, I feel like the Spirit of God is trying to, at times, you've got to stand up. You've got to stand on the Word. You've got to provide evidence. But sometimes, baby, you've got to call on the angels. Sometimes you just have to sit back and know there's somebody in that person's life that they'll hear the truth from, and it's not you. There's nothing that the apostles could have done to convince the religious right there that they were right. But God had a ram in the thicket. He had a voice from a random space and place that intervened and saved their life. Last one. We're tracking. We're tracking through Acts. Are you ready? This last one. I really feel the Spirit of God. I want to worship. I want to have ministry. I feel the Holy Spirit again helping us to process through religious persecution we've gone through, preparing us for what's to come in the days ahead. Okay, so you have religious persecution. They end up getting flogged. They're mocked and laughed at. Now they're arrested. Now they've, now they've been flogged and released. Gamaliel, Gamaliel intervenes. And now we're going to have something more. So verse 40, Acts 5, 40. And they took his advice and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them, ordered them to speak no more in the name, and they released them. Verse 41. So they've been flogged. Gamaliel intervenes. They don't die, but they get flogged. Listen to this. So when they went their way from the presence of the council, Ben, listen to this. Here is their response to religious persecution. They rejoiced. Listen to this. They rejoiced that they had been counted worthy to suffer the shame of the name. Dude, when's the last time a religious spirit working through someone's given you the business? And they're filling your mind with doubt and fear about all oh, that guy and that revival and that church and there. And you're just getting worn down. And those little devils are trying to convince you of lies and accusation. And you're, you're not falling into disbelief. You're not getting weary. You're not getting sad. You're not becoming a victim. You just feel this, whoa, there's, there's like some joy in here. I, I got like some, some joy bubbling up inside of me because, Lord, now I'm worthy. Yeah. 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 My, my, my. Folks, when's the last time you lifted up a shout because you were the target of religious persecution? Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, God, they're after us. The town's become religious. All my family and friends have turned against me. I've gone for revival. We're crying. And what, what if something on the inside of us began to rejoice and began to get gripped with, oh my gosh, I am saved. 
Oh my gosh, I have been given the gift of resiliency. Oh my gosh, Lord, thank you for choosing me to bear the shame of your name. I think it should be a t-shirt. I literally think we should make t-shirts that say, worthy to bear the shame of the name. Come on. Have you rejoiced lately that you're worthy? That people are talking smack about you? Have you ever counted yourself worthy yet that your friends and family are turning against you? Oh, the missionaries were murdered. Listen, I'm going I'm to help you one second. Oh, those poor missionaries on the field, they gave their life to the Lord. Oh, God. Wrong. Folks, according to the book of Revelation, when you're martyred, you just punched your first seat ticket into front and center before the throne of God. God counted them worthy enough to be a martyr. Dude, I hope some of you are getting messed up. What in the I've spent the last 30 years trying to get inner healing and deliverance from all my church hurt and religious persecution. And I keep telling the story about how they hurt me and how they did me wrong and how they didn't understand. And I've never even realized, oh, man, I should be one of the most joyful people out there. More, Lord. Dude, these guys were nuts. Listen, joy, thank you, God. I get to bear the shame for your name. Thank you for picking me. Hallelujah, I just got flogged. There's blood everywhere. It hurts, it's painful, but Jesus, thanks. Come on. Come on. Thanks. Thanks. And every day in the temple and from house to house, They kept on teaching and preaching. They would not shut up. Where is there a fire that's going to burn in your bones that can't be shut up by religion? Where is there a fire in a church that's not going to lay down because you got called a cult? And again, folks, it's not in, we're not angry and bitter and mad and the world's against us. We're actually pumped. We're joyful. We're not worried about them. We're thanking God. Massive persecution. Massive resolve. Acts 6. You land in the plane. They choose Stephen. Bad idea. The church is growing. The work of the the saints are in need. Hospital. They probably didn't have hospitals, but, you know, they needed counseling something. They needed help. And they're like, we can't do this. We want to give ourselves to the word and prayer. we got to pick some people. They pick Stephen. Stephen, verse 8, full of grace and power, performing great wonders and signs among the people. Guess what? You know, you, you, you could write it. Here's a guy full of power, full of grace. Who's next? Religious persecution. Rose up, argued with him. Verse 10. And yet they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. (sighs) You ain't going to get me, sucker. I'm untouchable. I'm so dead to myself that you can't offend me. Isn't that what revival is really about? I've died a thousand deaths at the foot of the cross so that when you attack and come against me with religious persecution, I don't even feel it anymore because I've been clothed with forgiveness in the blood of the Lamb. We're not going to get distracted. We're not going to worry who's speaking against the revival. I don't care who's speaking about the revival. Get in the revival. 
You can sit over there on frozen chosen assembly. You, you can sit over there on couch potato first Baptist. You can do whatever you want. I'm not letting your complacency and apathy keep me from burning with the fresh fire of God. You can slander me, accuse me, grow jealous of me. I'm not going to waste one precious moment I can be in prayer trying to convince you of something you'll never believe in because your heart's gone wicked toward God. And they secretly induce men to say, we've heard men speak blasphemy against Moses and against God. Religious persecution seeks to slander, accuse, and rally people in groups against you. Religious persecution seeks to slander, accuse, and rally people against you. How does Stephen respond? Are you ready? We're closing. Stephen in Acts 7 gives one of the greatest sermons in the book of Acts. He again directly appeals to the word of God and he tries to explain to religious persecution what's happening. He quotes in verse Acts 7, 49. Again, he goes right back to the Old Testament. In verse 51, he says he unveils the scripture. How does Stephen respond to religious persecution? We're going deeper into the book of Acts. He explains the word of God to them and then he rebukes them. I want to say to you, this is one of the only times where a man or woman of God rebukes religious persecution. This is real challenging because I'm a provocator. As I'm studying today, I'm like, oh man, Lord, maybe we need to do less coming against religion and rebuking it, and maybe we need to do more rejoicing that we're counted worthy of it. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart, always resisting the Holy Spirit, doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had been previously announced. Verse 54, now it's full tilt. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth. Notice the progression. In Acts 2, it's mocking and laughing. In Acts 7, they're literally full-on manifesting devils ready to slay them. And we know what they do to them. And you know who's there. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> this is crazy. Stephen is slain by religious persecution. And he models for us perhaps maybe the greatest lesson of all tonight. Yeah. Verse 59, and they went on stoning Stephen. And he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. Jesus has been put on the cross and he has been mocked and beaten and spit on and he is innocent. Yes, sir. And he's hanging there. And here's Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, signs, wonders, and miracles, just trying to give him the word, trying to help him. Just like they killed Jesus, they killed Stephen. But they both responded the same way. Are you ready? They forgave. Forgave. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know what my altar call tonight is? Who's ready to forgive? Come on. Come on. Tay and the team, can you guys come up? Maybe you didn't think we were going to get here. Maybe you thought this was some kind of brawl against religious persecution. That we were going to be justified in our pain. Folks, who's been hurt by the church? 
Who's been hurt by a leader? You felt betrayed. You felt abandoned. You felt misled. You felt persecuted. They didn't understand. Wave at me. Listen to me. Might be the hardest thing you hear in revival. It's going to happen again. Might be the hardest thing you ever you ever hear in revival. If anything I said tonight was true. If there's any kind of pattern of God moving, God pouring out his spirit and then religious persecution, you can take it to the bank. So here's our opportunity tonight. To take a few minutes and process through up to this point. All the church hurt. All the anger toward fathers and spiritual fathers and church leaders and men and women who just, some of you haven't been understood since you came out of the womb. Close your eyes with me. Let's begin to pray in the spirit because we're going to need the help of the Holy Spirit. I really believe tonight is about processing the past to prepare you for future revival and awakening. 